Today, this is such an important topic because of the vast number of people that didn't get involved in the occult, especially New Age, and don't even realize it. So let's begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we're so grateful that you came into this world to invite us into the kingdom of the Father. We're so grateful that you presented us with the good news of the invitation an invitation to turn our lives over to you and to be witnesses for you. We just ask you, Lord, that you would continue to open our hearts to your word as you open the hearts of the disciples when they walk with you. Help us to see the incredible dimensions of your word and the power of your word to affect the very depths of our being. Help us always also to see how your word is of power against the evil one, light against darkness, love against hatred, forgiveness against unforgiveness. And so we just ask your Holy Spirit to be upon us, to lead us and guide us, to open our eyes to a deeper dimension of your kingdom in our midst. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before I introduce Father Fortea, I just wanted to say that all of you have uh, an outline, and we encourage you to use it to, to take notes. And Father Fortea always welcomes questions even in the midst of presentations. If you have questions, he's most uh, happy to answer them. On the back side, you have um, you you might have questions as you go along that you don't want to ask at that particular time, so you can write those down. Questions for Monsignor Grzedek, questions for me, or questions for for Father Fortea. We want this to be a workshop that's enlightening, practical, down to earth, uh, very informative and yet something that gives all of us courage. I'm amazed again and again uh, at the extent to which we encounter the occult. And sometimes the people don't even know it, that they're involved in the occult. So much of it is new age. They get involved without even knowing it. It's so good that you recognize the signs and that you know how to deal with that. And so to help us understand more deeply how Satan works in our lives and the power we have to deal with that, uh, we brought in Father Fortea. Father Fortea is a priest from the Diocese of Madrid. He was ordained in 1994. And shortly after his ordination... His bishop said, I want you to get a degree. And I think he was hoping it would be in the history of theology. But he said, no, I want you to get a degree in demonology. But I don't want to get a degree in demonology. But I'm asking you to get a degree in demonology. <laughs> so Father obeyed, did what he said. And in the process of doing so, was in touch with um, many exorcists around the world and certainly has come to a profound understanding uh, of what this is all about. And people from all over Spain for the past, I guess, uh, 10 or 15 years have been sending people to him. People from the United States have flown over to him uh, in order to be uh, set free. And so it is my privilege to introduce to you a very learned, holy, pious, joyful person, Father Fortea. Let's give him a strong welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, in this morning, we will uh, overview the whole subject that is the demonology. Um, 
we will see first the world of the demons in the second moment of the morning I will speak about uh, possession and at the third time from one to two we will speak about exorcism and we reserve the last one time just for details more questions curiosities but uh, second and third time uh, is very interconnected possession and exorcism and probably mm, the topic will will be explained in a joint form while I am speaking uh, I like to receive questions for me is more uh, is more interesting just not to speak but to answer then after a time speaking if anybody wants an acclaration, a question, something, do not doubt to, to raise your hand. About the demons. Why, why there, there are demons? Why God did not create the angelic natures and directly send all of them to heaven? Even he could do with human beings too, directly to create souls and to send to heaven. Why did not do that? Did not do that? The answer is very clear. God may create a material universe just doing that, and another universe, and another. Every second, he can create another universe. And he can create every second a universe that is double in dimensions, in beauty, in, in quality. Imagine every second a better universe, double than the past one. And he could be for centuries creating universe and his power will be the same. He will not be tired. And he could continue for centuries, thousands of years, no end. Of course, there is no time but uh, in God, but there is time in the universe and he can create another universe a second later after time appear in every universe. You may consider how great is the power of God. And I will say a pastoral and a spiritual uh, thing. Uh, we have no f fear, has no reason before such a great God. Uh, if he could do that, fear has no reason for us. He may do everything. Then, God may do that with the material universe. But the only thing that he cannot create is love. Love cannot be created. L to, to have love, you have to create a being having intelligence, having free will. He has to know the other person. And he may love. But love is something that he cannot force. Love is not force, is an invitation. It's something that happens naturally with when an intelligent person with free will knows something and he began to love. But it's a process too. You may create universe in just a second, but love is something that God cannot create. That's something very important to understand. If you create free will for love to appear in the universe, you accept the possibility that that free will chooses uh, bad options. If you create free will it may appear Mother Teresa of Calcutta, but it may appear Hitler. Eh? 
that is not a failure in the plan of God. It's just something that from the beginning he knew perfectly. It's not a failure in the order of God. If you want that love appear on universe, you have to accept the possibility hatred appear. Most of the beings that uh, were having brown decisions will be just with a little evil, but some of them with a great evil. That is the same in the human world and in the angelic world. And in the good, the same. If you create free will, some of them they will be good, some of them very good, some of them very holy. Eh? The mission of God is just to create free will and then to give freedom to, for they may choose whatever they wish. God, when he sees that a, a free will is going apart from him, he may take out the freedom of that will. But he is a father and he always say, no, I'm going to give more time because I want him to repent. He could put apart uh, a free will when he begins to see that that uh, human or that angel is going in the wrong way. But as a father, he gives more possibilities. And he knows many of them repent because he does his best for free wills to return to the good way. But if they go farther and farther in the bad way, it doesn't matter if it's an angel or a human, he feels more the necessity to give more time because he knows that he has harmed eternity, his eternity, in such a bad way that he wants over all his repentance. That is the reason that sinners, bad angels or bad human, uh, they have time to repent. They have so many possibilities. Why God does not stop evil? Because he gives more possibilities. But it is true at the same time that these have a bad side effect. If he gives more time, the evil one may have more time to go farther and farther in the bad way. What is the reason that some people reach such peaks of evil? Because God gave to them many possibilities to return, not to have such a bad eternity. But this has a limit. When really God knows that uh, there is no reason to give more time, because the will was complete completely, completely directed to do evil, then he say is enough. And the time of probation finish in this world. The same was for the angels. That has an implication very beautiful, I think, for our lives as a priest. As priest. When we see somebody, for example, as Castro, I wonder years ago why he is living so many years if he is a bad person responsible for death, for imprisonment, to, to take out freedom from many people, to make millions of people to live in poverty. Why do you give so much life? And the answer appears in one case of uh, demonic possession in an exorcism when demons say that um, while your father has hope for a people to go back in his way he gives more time 
only when your father have no hope at all, then he say, your time is ended. Then remember in your priest life, when you have notice of somebody very, very bad person, remember, if he continues living, it's just because our father have hope on him. Perhaps you not, perhaps the family not, perhaps the victims not. But if he continues on earth, is because Almighty God say, no, I have hope. The very same day that God loses hope of he will convert, he will die. That's for sure. Then, as you see, the order of God is wonderful. It's wonderful. He has done everything in the best way. And demons or people in hell are not errors in the plan of God. It's a necessary fruit of giving freedom. Necessary for it that free will, some of them, they will go in the bad way. God created uh, angels and every angel with power, a beauty, and intelligence. The angelic natures were different, each one. Not everyone the same as the other, but different in the gifts they receive. Because there are such differences, we can speak about a hierarchy. And more because being intelligent beings, they are a society. They are not just individuals, but every intelligent being. If you have a community of them, they form a society. Connected with hierarchy, with different functions, and so on. To that society, he gave a kind of probation. Angels have a kind of time. St. Thomas of Aquino called Evo. Yeah. It's not like the time in the material world, but there is a time before, a time, a time later. Yeah. They think now in this, later in this, later in this, the free will the same. Now I wish I want this, I wish that other thing, I hope that. Uh, the free will of the intelligent beings change, and that is the reason that we can speak about the time. Eh? It's not exactly this time uh, as here, but um, it's time, the ebo. Then they have a time. What happened in that time of probation? Uh, the Bible says nothing about that. But many mystics, many uh, long history, have said that um, God showed that he was to incarnate, to be incarnated. God said, I will create human beings and I will be incarnated in one of them. Notice that they did not see God, the face of God, the substance of God was hidden from them. Speaking in visual terms, probably they saw like a light, a wonderful, great light, incomparable to them, to the light of the angels. But they did not see the face of God, nobody may see the face of God and later he can see. The probation was because they knew that there was a God but they did not see his substance. After seeing God no possibility of sin because temptation never will succeed because we will say I have seen the treasure of God how now I can choose this little dirty thing that is sin. 
never we will fail after that moment. That is the reason that on heaven there is complete freedom, but no possibility of deceit because uh, it's a treat that we will never accept. Then the angels knew there was God. They knew in a natural way, as humans do, that they were created. They knew in a natural way, as we do, that uh, he was infinite and good and everything. But through his intelligence. And then, when that message from God appeared, I will be incarnated in a future creature, creature I will create. They were astonished. Many mystics say it was something so surprising for them. How high we are. And God is incredible more. And he is going to be such a mammal, um, a place that... But they knelt before that uh, decreed from God. Later, many mystics say they received the vision of um, the crucifixion. And God said, I want you to worship me as crucified in a cross. And at that moment, many mystics say that some of them, they began to doubt. How is possible an intelligent being like God ask such a thing from us? They thought something is working not well here. Eh? How the goodness may ask to us something that we do not see as a good because it's too much generosity, too much humility. And uh, especially uh, the first demon of all, we call then Satanas, uh, he began to have his own ideas. And later, the mystics say, he asked the third step and the last one. I will create a human being and I will give her all kind of spiritual treasures, all kind of spiritual jewels, and she will be my mother and she will be your queen. And you will have to respect and obey her as a queen. I am the king, you will have a queen. And then Satanas and other angels say, no, that is too much. We may accept the first step, but this last step show us that something wrong is in God now. He cannot ask such a thing. And then they felt so humiliated, son of Dan, that they wanted an independent destiny. They want to be autonomous from God. It did not begin everything with hatred. It began everything just with a desire of autonomy, a desire to have their own destiny. A desire to have ways apart from a God that in their judgment was doing things not well. That is what, what mystics say. We do not know for certain if it's true, but independent mystics have uh, touched the same. And if it's not true, at least is uh, a possibility to understand how the failure of angels was. If it's not true, we can understand that it was something similar. No other possibilities of sins were in the angelic uh, natures. Uh, sex, food, or 
it has no sense on that world. But this, it has perfect sense. Uh, then some uh, angels were apart. They decided to speak among themselves what to do. And that was the battle. That was the battle. It was the battle of intelligence. It was a battle between the intelligence of the good one saying no. What the Lord has said is hard. He knows how hard it is for us, but everything is good. And the other intelligence say no. Freedom. Have a free destiny apart from God. Let us go apart from his wrong decisions. No hatred at the beginning. That was the battle because it was no necessity of swords and any other kind of weapons. It was a, a fight, a struggle of uh, intelligence and many fall, but they cannot die. It, it, they fall to the other part. And at the same time, the reasons of the good ones took son of them to the good uh, par uh, it it was a, it, that's sure a wonderful battle uh, I saw a battle on heaven says St. John and uh, finally with time more and more holiness appear in the angels that they need a great uh, form to be faithful to God and they become holy. Because this battle, uh, to explain it, is very fast uh, to do it in just some minutes, but uh, in, in the Ebo, could be for us years or centuries or whatever you think. It was different from our time, but it was a long time, a long Ebo, even if time it was not very much. And in that battle, thing in terms of years in our time, some of them they pray to have faith to resist. They needed faith. They did not see God. Uh, um, they needed even ascetical acts. Angels call to ascetical acts. Not from food or from material things, but even our intelligence may say, no, do not think in that. Insist in thinking in that. For example, when you go to sleep, you may do an ascetical act with your brain. You may go to sleep and think in things of the day and things that you like, or you may go to bed uh, in a dialogue with God, speaking with Him, praying. It's harder to pray if you want to think in something. That is an example how ascetical acts, ascetical deeds may be done only with uh, our spiritual uh, gifts. Uh, at the same time, in the other part, if in, in one part appear Holiness, ascetics, angels, ascetical angels, and angels fighting with the war to other angels and many things. In the bad part appear more sins, even hatred, even angels saying how he had done such a thing to us. And they become worse and worse. Two different societies were forming at that time. The society of demons and the society of angels um, demons were going worse and worse angels were going better and better at the beginning they were just angelic natures with no love at the time of the creation in the probation they become good they become with love with faith with hope some of them even holy some of them they fight very hard to make many bad angels to return. The same we see on earth happen on that moment 
in that society that was dividing into the same. The angelic world was very variated, you say variated, variado, was very diverse, variated, with many possibilities, because we are on earth, it's hard for us to understand how an angel may do so many things as we, but they can, they can. And um, finally, God put an end to the, to the time of probation, or finally, some of them, they finish with a definitive will to maintain his choice, their choice, and the other ones, finally, they had a definitive uh, will to maintain his choice for God. For God. Those good ones were introduced in the presence of God. Perhaps together, perhaps each one in the moment God wanted. But they were introduced not in a place. God is not in a place. They were introduced in a new state. The state of uh, seeing the substance of God, the Holy Trinity, face to face. Uh, from that moment, there was no possibility to go back bar. The other ones went apart. Uh, I insist, uh, we don't speak in terms of places, it's in terms of a state. The state of many of them was completely far from God. They changed themselves into monsters as the other angels change into spiritual beauties, supernatural beauties. The way the grace work on them is parallel completely to the human beings. And the way sin proceeds is an evolution completely parallel as sin uh, goes in, in human beings. Because we are spiritual beings too with a body but we are essentially spiritual beings our body will be destroyed and we will exist because our soul is what has the most noble part of our being then we are spiritual beings and we can understand perfectly the reasons, evolution, everything of the bad angels and the evolution of the good ones. Then we have those two parts and understand that God respected the decision to have an independent destiny. He did not force to then to love him. That would have been impossible. That will have been bad, something bad. God respected. Many theologians say uh, hell is lack from inside. It's not that God say, you, the revenge of God, you go to that place and I will lack you. No, 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 no. God is the same. Is love, is comprehension. It's, he is always with his open arms to receive anybody. They are who go far from him. That is the same for humans. And what happened with demons make us to understand very well the nature of hell, the true nature of hell. It's not God who lack some people in a place, the revenge like a judgment saying, I decide you are condemned. No. The decision is a personal decision. To go far from him is a personal decision. They can return whenever they wish. Even, theor theoretically speaking, if one being in hell, human hell or angel hell, he will say, I will repent. I will ask forgiveness. I want to love God. I love you, God. He will go to, to heaven. But that is impossible to happen 
because they have a definitive will not to go backward. And that decision is possible to take it. There is, pos there is the possibility that will be so firmly decided not to go backward that finally there is nothing to do. That is a possibility, yes. And the more time it passes, the more t time, the more the will is uh, petrified on on that decision. That is the reason that there is no hope for anybody that is in hell. Then we see that there is. We have only five minutes. Um, um, there, there we see that we have a hierarchy and another hierarchy. God uh, may did to be completely apart from the material world, that bad hierarchy, but he wanted that they could um, interact with us for our good, for our spiritual good. Because temptation makes us to fight harder to have virtues. It is true that if we are tempted, we will have more sins. That is true. But at the same time, if we resist, we will have more glory. If we sin more, for that is purgatory. But if we love more, because it was harder, we will have more glory for all eternity. That is the wonderful plan of God. To permit more sins, because he knows we are weak, knowing that our glory be better, because we have fought in a harder way. Yeah. That is the reason he permitted. He could say no. Demons will not be able to tempt people on the earth. But he knows eternity. And he knew that more fruits will come if we um, fight on that way. I will give you one example. If one person uh, sins uh, lujuria is luxury, Luxury? Lujuria? Somebody speaks Spanish? Lujuria is luxury? Yeah. If somebody uh, sin of luxury um, is a sin of weakness. But if somebody resists very hard to the temptation is a deed of love a deed of faith because he uh, he will maintain that chastity only for faith he gets nothing more as you see is not the same a sin of luxury than a deed of chastity a sin of chastity it's worth more than 100 uh, sins of luxury because all those sins or sins for weakness. But those deeds of faith, love, that they were so hard, are pure love. The person got nothing but just uh, to do the will of God. That is something that may, uh, may permit you to understand the reason from God, to, of God, to permit demons to tempt us. And, um, but I think that uh, I want to be very, very obedient to time. I will continue perhaps later a little more, and we have the four moment of the day to speak more about demons. Yeah? As you see, it's a very extinct world in three quarters of hours, yes, we have overview the first moment of, of the fall and race of the angels to heaven. 
uh, it's a very, very diverse, rich, interesting world. Uh, yes, we have seen a little of this spiritual world. You could uh, go deeper and deeper in your whole life and you will discover more and more things because angels are very willing to speak with those uh, who speak to them. Speak to your angels. You have one at your side all the time. Demons are not at your side all the time. They come, they tempt you, they leave. But angels are the whole day and night, the whole life at your side. And they like you very much to be friend of the person that they have to protect. But unfortunately, most of the people never speak to them. They live uh, as if they were not at their sides. Then they are very thankful. Not only you may ask to protect from temptation, but you may say, please remind me that. Please wake me at that time. Uh, many things. You have to speak with somebody and you may say, angel, please speak in favor of me to that person, to the other angel. Uh, uh, you may use for many, many things. And sometimes even they, they do in a very visible way. Uh, there are many people that say somebody appear to me and um, help me and when I uh, I wanted to see again he had disappeared uh, there are many many stories about that uh, in, in, in the world even for me I think there was once that I doubt such a person was a real person and not an angel because angels when appear to help they appear dressed normally as a human person and and they disappear. That is the reason many people know that was an angel. But they help us more than we think. In one time, I know almost sure that that was an angel. It was a very, very uh, hard situation. I was completely lost. And the person that came to me from the very first moment surprised me very much for his face. His face was spreading love, spreading so many good things that I was surprised just for the face of that old man that came directly to me to help me. Uh, uh, sure that if you are friends of the angels, they will help you in many ways. Uh, Thank you very much, Father Forte. I know that much of this is, uh, at the beginning, is abstract when we're talking about the angelic world. But I'm glad, glad you were very practical and said that, if I understood you correctly, that you could even ask the angel to wake you in the morning. Is that correct? And uh, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have given you an alarm clock this morning. But thank you very, very much. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the role of a bishop and when we're talking about the role of a bishop, we're talking about the role of the diocesan bishop. I'm not a diocesan bishop. I'm an auxiliary bishop. A diocesan bishop is the one who is in charge of the diocese. The diocesan bishop can delegate someone to be an exorcist, and uh, that's not the role of an auxiliary bishop. Um, so I um, wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, um, from the Catholic Catechism, who can perform an exorcism? And the Catholic Catechism tells us that the Church, when the Church asks, this is um, uh, Catholic Catechism number 1673, and I think it's always good for you to have these references so you can look up this concrete material. When the Church asks publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus that the person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion, it is called exorcism. Jesus performed exorcisms, and from him the church has received the power and the office of exorcising. In a simple form, exorcism is performed in a celebration of baptism. 
The solemn exorcism called a major exorcism can be performed only by a priest and with the permission of a bishop. The priest must proceed with prudence, strictly observing the rules established by the church. Exorcism is directed at the expulsion of the demon and to the liberation from demonic possession through the spiritual authority which Jesus entrusted to his church. Illness, especially psychological illness, is a very different matter. Treating this is the concern of medical science. Therefore, before an exorcism is performed, it is important to ascertain that the one is dealing with the presence of the evil one and not with an illness. Uh, we always insist that individuals be uh, referred to a psychiatrist when we think there are some issues like this. Um, that's very, very important. Um, and then, of course, an exorcist, a trained exorcist like Father Fortea, can distinguish between there are, there are individuals who have mental illnesses and also have can be possessed. You can have both. But a trained exorcist is, is, knows how to tell the difference. And the difference becomes very, very clear when he begins to take authority over the evil one, even in a language that the... Um, a uh, possessed person does not know. And Father Forteo will, will get into more of that later on. Canon law. Canon 1172 tells us, no one can legitimately perform exorcisms over possessed unless that individual has obtained special and express permission from the local ordinary. And again, the ordinary is the diocesan bishop. Such permission from the local ordinary is to be granted only to a presbyter endowed with piety, knowledge, prudence, and integrity. Now, if this is something that you deeply desire, you should never be given this. If this is something that you think will make your day, it will make your day and more. Uh, because if you want it, then Satan wants you and he will have you. So this is not something that people want. It's something that um, the Archbishop appoints someone to do because it requires a person that's very humble, very prayerful, uh, very knowledgeable, um, and also usually a, a man, a priest of more mature age. Um, and Father will get into many of these things later on. Your role is going to be the role of discernment when people come to you um, and to discern the difference between um, the need for exorcism, for example, which is possession, or the need for deliverance, which is, um, which is obsession, or the need for exorcism of place which is infestation. Um, those are all things that will be developed as we, as we go along. Um, so, but your role is very, very important in the sense that you don't jump to conclusions, but that you prayerfully work your way through, that you listen very carefully to what's going on, and possession are very, very rare. Most of the time, it's just a lot of um, obsession and your role is very important in that because you can give them tools that they can deal with it and your working with them is very very important in order to set them free and I'll give you some examples perhaps uh, later on three things that can make a demon leave during exorcism and it's pretty much um, it's pretty much the devil uh, the demon itself decides to leave. Sometimes during a, uh, during an exorcism, the demon cries out, like, it did, what are you trying to do, destroy us? Uh, like it did to Jesus. But they'll say, you're torturing me, I hate you, I don't like you, um, and all those kinds of things. Well, it means that, you're, that uh, the, the exorcist is making the demon feel very uncomfortable. And so, 
sometimes the demon itself uh, decides to leave because it's too, unco- it's too um, uncomfortable. Um, sometimes it's the priestly power of the exorcist that forces it to leave. And sometimes an angel sent by God forces it to leave. We wish we would have control over the exact time and place. When the exorcist begins, um, he addresses the demon and, and commands it to give him his name and the hour and the day of his departure. Uh, and sometimes the demon listens, sometimes the demon doesn't. But a demon will leave when it decides to leave, when a priestly power forces it, or an angel sent by God forces it to leave. And sometimes, um, I think there was a very famous case here in um, St. Louis back in 1949, upon which the exorcist was was, uh, based. And um, talking to some of the Jesuits, the word that I have is that um, it was St. Michael that um, drove him out. And it happened on Easter Monday. And apparently there was a very dramatic manifestation in the college church. This didn't even take place in the college church, but people in the college church saw an image of St. Michael at the very time there was a loud explosion and the individual left. So sometimes they're um, driven out by an angel. It doesn't have to be St. Michael, but are driven out by an angel. 